Hi everybody and welcome back to our tech study for the season of Lent following our theme between our rock and hard places. You'll see that we're on our third week here and we are moving away from the Gospel of Mark to the Gospel of John. Um, it's, uh, it, I don't know why the Common Lectionary Committee decided to switch Gospels for a little bit, but we're going to be in the Gospel of John up until we get to Palm Sunday and then we'll go back to Mark's telling of the story. You know, there are differences between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are typically called the synoptic gospels. That means they see with the same eye, um, or they're seeing together, as it were. Um, and if you look at those gospels in their outline, they follow the same outline pretty clearly. John followed a different outline altogether, and we'll see that today in our reading. But I've always thought there were some strange uh, correspondences between John and Mark, theologically, that, that often get missed. Um, and so one day when we have an enormous amount of time, we'll talk about that. It won't be in this video, okay? So, if you have any questions about our process, our timing, anything like that, uh, we will be meeting Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time here at St. Mark's campus to have a one-hour discussion. It will be on Zoom, and you can watch it at your convenience if you need to. My name is Mark Davis. I have the honor of being the pastor here at St. Mark, and I welcome you to this study. So throughout this season, we're looking at biblical text in terms of a three-step formulation that was suggested by the biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann where some texts, he argued, begin with an orientation and introduce a disorientation in order to come to a reorientation. I think that is true of our text this week, just like it was last week and the week before, but this week I think it's only true of the first half of our text. So we're going to separate our text into two halves, and in the first half, we'll follow this orientation, disorientation, reorientation formula. In the second half, I, I, I think we have to go a different route, and it is compact and full of meaning. So let's start with the part that I would say is the orientation, which is verses 13 and 14 of John chapter 2. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Okay, so if we think about this as the orientation, the, the, the very first thing I want you to just pay attention to is time and place, okay? We're talking about the Passover. In my blog called Left Behind and Loving It, I translate text every week, and in this translation, instead of Passover, I have the word Pascha, because that's a transliteration of the actual Greek term. Um, and, and what it sounds like is something akin to what we think of as a common pilgrimage, particularly a pilgrimage to a holy place during a specific holy time. So the season is the season of the Passover, the Pascha. The word Pascha means something like um, to, to, to escape or to be, um, to be sanctuaried, as it were. And it's talking about the story of the Passover when the death angel went through the camp uh, in Egypt where the Israelis, uh, Israelites were being held captive. And it skipped over the house of the Israelites. And, and the death angel killed the first child of each family. It's a horrible story, and, um, and yet it's a, it's a story that, that tries to get us to comprehend the horror of the slavery and the, and the context from which Moses rescued the people of Israel. So every year, Passover is remembered, and it's remembered with you know, unleavened bread and, and all kinds of ceremonies. It's a huge, high holy day, even to this day, for, for practicing Jews. And in Jesus' day certainly was a time when someone might make the trip from Galilee, as it were, to Jerusalem 
to be there for the celebration of the Passover. Um, so that, that contextualizes when we are, and now we're going to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, already we're seeing a big difference between the Gospel of John and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Jesus does not go to Jerusalem until the very end of his ministry, the end of his life, as it were. Mark even scribes it out daily that it's the last week of Jesus' life that he enters into Jerusalem. And Jesus had already indicated he's going to Jerusalem expressly for the purpose of being rejected, killed, and raised. Um, not so in, in John's Gospel. Jesus goes to Jerusalem several times. There are several mentions of Passover celebration. Um, and so part of what we'll do on Wednesday is, is think about how long this ministry of Jesus is and, and, and when it takes place. But what we have here is the pilgrimage. And part of the orientation of this, of this story is, is the setting. It's the Passover, High Holy Day. And we're in Jerusalem. And we're in the temple. We're in the temple. That's, that's, uh, that's no small thing to be in the temple. And as part of being in the temple, we have the cattle, the sheep, the dove sellers, and the money changers. Now, if this is the orientation to the story, for many first century Jews going to the temple for the purpose of Passover, this all is very, very normal. You would want to buy cattle. You would want to buy sheep or a lamb. If you're very, very poor, at best, you'll want to buy a dove or a turtle dove. Um, and use that to make your, your sacrifice, and to offer as a sacrifice. Um, part of the Passover celebration was, was doing these acts of uh, uh, both contrition and sacrifice. So, so while we know the story and how it ends up, and this all looks hideous to us, um, let's make sure that if we find it troubling, we find it troubling for the right reason. Um, this is not like somebody just let a bunch of wild animals run loose inside of a holy place. That's not, that's not the problem here. It's not that they're having a pet blessing during the middle of, uh, you know, Easter ceremony or something like that in a Christian church. It's not, that's not the issue here that there are animals and there's commerce happening here. This was very common. People who might have to travel a long way to get to the temple, people who had been living in city because of the urbanization that had happened over the last several centuries and are no longer people who raise cattle or sheep, um, that they would need to have access to a market where they can buy these things. And so it seems like we are now in the outer courts of the temple where uh, people were allowed apparently to do these things and we have sheep and cattle, we have people selling doves, and there are money changers. Why are there money changers? That, that, that's not a sign for grubbers, you know, for money grubbing people. Um, that, that, that signifies that they took one kind of coinage and changed it for another. And the reason being, when you get into the inner courts of the temple, you are not allowed to have coinage that has the inscription of a living thing on it. That's, a, that's an image. And images are not, graven images are not allowed in that area. Now, if you live in the Roman Empire, lots of people have coinage with one of the Caesar's face imprinted on it or some other local deity or king or something, um, but not in the temple. So the money changers were there so people could bring their common coinage and change that for a temple currency. If you ever get to see the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit, make sure you pay attention to the coins that are there. And you'll see that in the temple currency, you might have something like a sheaf of wheat that's been cut and it's represented because it's no longer a living thing. Or you might have letters or numbers, but you're not gonna have a picture of somebody. 
Um, so, so this is all the orientation, and for many first century Jews, before the destruction of the temple, this was all just what you're supposed to find there when pilgrims are arriving from all over the map in order to celebrate the Passover. So initially, this is the orientation of the story, but then suddenly we get into a really abrupt disorientation. Making a whip of cords, Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Of all of the disorienting things we've read, this may be the most disorienting of all, right? Um, so let's look at it for a moment. It involves a whip, so there, there's at least the, the presence of some sort of violence here. Uh, it involves driving out cattle and sheep. You drive out dove sellers, you don't just open the cages and let them fly away. Um, and uh, turning over the tables of the money changers, um, pouring out their coins, and saying, stop making my father's house an emporium. That's, that's a transliteration of the Greek word that's used there, emporium. Um, so somehow, all of these things, uh, the commerce that had been built up, perhaps, perhaps, with the best of intentions, in order to allow these pilgrims to buy sacrifices for a sacrificial system that was put in place back when everybody had their own cattle or their own sheep or had access to turtle doves. Um, something about that, Jesus describes as turning God's house, his father's house, into an emporium, a marketplace. And, and that's the thing that Jesus is disrupting here in this disorientation part. So it's easy to kind of see that, it, you know, Jesus is going off here. It's crazy Jesus, violent Jesus, or maybe it's zealous Jesus. And that leads us to the reorientation of the first half of our reading. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Um, it, there's a lot going on in that verse, and it may not initially strike us as a reorientation. It might just say, well, they just remembered something. But, um, first of all, the fact that the disciples remembered a scripture is a big deal. This would be a decisive difference between the nature of John's gospel and the nature of the gospel of Mark. Remember last week, when Jesus asked, who are you saying that I am? And Peter, on behalf of the twelve, said that you are the Christ. And Jesus shut them down immediately. That was part of a pattern that you see in the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples are consistently getting it wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And not comprehending. Uh, you know, there's a moment where they, they said this because they didn't understand. The, the meaning of the lobes, um, they didn't understand. They didn't know. It, it repeated over and over again in Mark's gospel, the, the, the ignorance of the disciples. So it's kind of a significant thing here, even early on, that John says the disciples remembered the scripture. Um, an interesting question to ask, that I don't think is very clear from the text is did, did they remember it right then, right there, while this, in the aftermath of this kind of violent disorientation in the temple, did, is that when they remembered? Or are we talking about the disciples after the resurrection, looking back on that story and remembering? And the only reason I, I posit that second option is because in a few minutes, we're going to have another moment when the disciples remember something. And it's explicit then that after his resurrection, they remembered something. So, so I, I don't know if we're talking about the pre-resurrection, in the moment disciples actually remembering 
the scripture or if this is a post-resurrection remember. The scripture that they do remember is Psalm 69. Psalm 69. That psalm is a prayer uh, of someone who is praying for rescue from persecution. And um, the entirety of verse 9 in that psalm reads, It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult me, you have fallen on me. So, that whole psalm is a description of someone who is persecuted, put upon, rejected, insulted, and is calling out for God to deliver them from that. So in some ways, uh, the fact that the disciples remember the 69th Psalm, which is about someone who is persecuted, may fit better on the other side of the cross than it does here in the temple where Jesus seems to be the one initiating all the violence here. Um, so again, I, I just wonder, when did they remember this, and, and, and how, do, how does the context of Psalm 69 actually inform what they're remembering there? It's, it's a curious thing. I, I worry about the phrase, zeal for your house has consumed me, because I think it's very simple for someone to take that verse out of context and, and to use that as, as a justification for all kinds of violent acts. And um, I, I think once you put it back in the context, you realize that it's spoken by someone who is being violated. That's why I think it's probably a post-resurrection remembrance. And, um, and it's all about zeal and being consumed by zeal. Literally, it's eating me <laughs> is how I would, would translate in a, in a more wooden translation. Um, to be consumed with zeal for God's house means that you walk in to this moment that looks like it's perfect orientation, everything makes sense, even the stuff that might be a little unseemly is just an accommodation to how things have changed, and you upset that because God's house is being turned into an emporium. Um, that, that, that's a reason why many churches, and frankly why I, um, as a leader of a church, am always a little nervous about emphasizing stewardship too much. Um, I think it's the right thing that people give. And I think, it's, I, I think it's a healthy thing for people to give. And to give well, to give generously and joyfully. But it does seem that if you go on and on about it, you're just another church trying to turn your church into a marketplace. And, 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 and this, uh, this remembrance, <laughs> it, 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 it really kind of cautions us against that. So that's the orientation, all things running smoothly for all the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover, the disorientation where Jesus completely turns everything up on his head, and then the reorientation, the point is that God's house is not to be an emporium. What John does not have Jesus saying is, my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all people. That's a different Old Testament text that the Matthew, Mark, and Luke will appeal to. But for John, it's just the fact that they had turned the temple into an emporium. That's the problem. So that's the first half of our text. And now uh, we have a halftime show. I had Usher lined up to perform for us, but he, uh, he hurt himself in a rollerblading accident earlier today. And so just pretend we're having a halftime show Stop your video, imagine dancing and singing, and now we'll move to the second half of our text, which um, is a different five verses that I don't think really fit the orientation, disorientation, reorientation formula. There is so much packed into these verses that we are just going to skim them for now, and I'm just going to raise some questions for you and give you some parameters of how to think about it 
that we'll have to wait until Wednesday to pick up in our discussion. Okay, so let's, let's read it over a couple of slides. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Okay. In this part two, there, there's just a whole lot going on here. I, I should say this. I say it every time it comes up in translation. And I'm going to keep saying it till I die. Uh, Richard Horsley has argued that the word typically translated as the Jews, which sounds in Greek, reads in Greek, Judeoi, should be translated the Judeans not the Jews. He says that in the context of the Gospel of Mark, because in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is clearly a Galilean. He spent all but the last week of his life in Galilee and, um, and seems to reflect what one might call a Galilean form of piety, of being faithful to the God of Israel. That's different from a Judean form of piety. Um, and so what we might be witnessing in Mark's gospel is a struggle for the heart of the Jewish soul, whether it's the Judean approach or the, uh, or the Galilean approach, with Jesus being more of the Galilean approach. We'll save that conversation in detail for some other time, but ever since I read that, um, whenever I translate the word Judeoi, whether it's in Mark or any other gospel or in Paul's writing, um, I, I typically translate it Judean, Judean. In Paul's writings, you might be able to make the case that he really has Jews in general in mind. In the Gospels, I think it's not so clear. And I think we are often listening to an interfamilial conversation and treating it like it's a conversation between us and them, Christians and Jews. Um, so I, I, I just want you to be aware of that, that as I'm reading this and it says, the Jews said to him, um, I want to be sensitive to how that word has been used in a lot of anti-Semitic ways in biblical studies over the years. And I want us to hear Judean, if you can. I think that's a good thing for us to be trained into doing. So the Judeans asked Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? That this... We're, on Wednesday, we're going to really just hold this question for a minute. Why did they put it this way? Why did they put it this way? Um, Jesus' authority can be questioned in a number of ways. And he's just destroyed you know, the, the place, turned over tables, let, drove animals out with a whip, um, let, you know, poured out coins and 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 shooed people away. It, it would seem like one might say a lot of things other than asking, what, what sign can you show us for doing these things? Um, so the word sign is very important. The reason they ask it this way has a lot to do with the way John's gospel unfolds. So that's one thing we're going to talk about on Wednesday, is why they shape their question. This is the first thing they say to Jesus after all that upsetting, is what sign can you show us for what you're doing? And Jesus' response to them seemed very abruptly to change the conversation. What sign can you show us for doing these things? And Jesus says to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up again. That seems like a topic that came out of nowhere. Um, if anyone seems to be destroying the temple, it seems to be Jesus, <laughs> not them. Um, the word temple, the reason I have it in italics here, it's a different word than what we saw up in verse uh, 14. 
when it says they came to Jerusalem to the temple. This is the word that, that refers more to the inner sanctum part of the temple than the whole complex itself. So you might refer to the campus of St. Mark as St. Mark Church, and you might refer to the sanctuary room itself as St. Mark Church on occasion, but more specifically, you would call it the sanctuary. Um, it, this is a more specific term than the one we saw earlier. So the idea is that perhaps all the, the commerce that was going on is in that outer court, and now Jesus is referring to the inner court. He's going to mention the word temple, and it will come up over the next three verses. So, but, it, but it's really odd that suddenly Jesus changes the topic. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. That whole notion of Jesus raising up the temple after three days also is a bit odd. We, of course, think of the resurrection. Jesus was raised on the third day. Um, but that's almost always in the passive voice when Jesus speaks about it. He'll be raised. Not, he's not the one doing the raising. Um, so this is a really curious response. It seems to shift the topic a little bit. And again, we're going to unpack it a little more on Wednesday. I can't say that I can make it entirely clear what the heck is going on here. But we're, but we're going to hack at it together. And then they respond to Jesus, what? The temple's been under construction 46 years. You're going to raise it in three days? This is math, y'all. This is math. And um, we're going to talk about the math on Wednesday. And the question I want you to ask yourself between now and then is this. How old is Jesus? How old is Jesus here? How old do you think Jesus is during his ministry? How long do you think his ministry lasts? How old do you think Jesus is when he's crucified? How old is Jesus? That has a lot to do with uh, these numbers because the first thing we hear when they say this temple's been under construction for 46 years is that in fact Jesus is not talking about the building he's talking about his own body that temple that that's an interesting turn of events again again we'll have to wait to do, till Wednesday to to probe that a little more deeply but I want you to hear the uh, the very final thing um, is that the disciples remembered and believed Go back to verse 22 and look at how this story ends. It happens after the resurrection. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he did these things. And they believed in the scriptures and in Jesus' words. They didn't believe the signs. They remembered, they believed in the scriptures and Jesus' words. That, that seems to be post resurrection form of faith whereas seeing the signs might be the pre-resurrection form of faith remember that and we'll pick that up on Wednesday um, I, I know I've said a lot I've burst through these last five verses very quickly I really do want us to pay more attention to them than to the actual temple incident uh, on Wednesday because I feel like there's a lot to unpack here and I have to say I have a lot to learn about the impact of those five verses so we will pick that up soon again if you have any questions you can write to us you can uh, give us a call other than that I hope to see you on Wednesday thanks bye